like to go along. So <laughs> just Bruce. All right. <laughs> hey, I didn't even make that one. No, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, good morning. It's good to be with you today. Uh, for those of you who are feeling well and able to be here at church. And for those of you who might not be feeling so well or are home today, uh, it's good to gather together. It's good to spend time in the Word of God. And uh, I trust that today is an opportunity for all of us to grow closer in our love for Him. Uh, right now, we are going through a teaching series on the book of Acts. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 5, verses 33 through 42. So I invite you to turn there in your Bibles, or we're also going to have the Scripture up on the screen, Acts chapter 5, verses 33 through 42. Last week, we kind of left at a little bit of a cliffhanger with Scripture in that we talked about a, uh, a moment of oppression that happened for the early church. We've been looking through the story of how God began to work through the body of Christ, the, the, these believers after Christ had died and resurrected and ascended into heaven, and the way this group of believers, of followers of Jesus, were instructed and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live and to be these representatives of Christ in their community, in their time, in their place. And we've been seeing how the political pressure has been continuing to rise for the early church, how Rome weren't big fans of Jesus, but they kind of let it exist. But the real issue were the religious leaders of Israel. They did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So everything that the early church was doing and talking about when they said, now Jesus is the Messiah, the religious leaders were trying to stop it. And so last week we saw how they gathered the apostles and they increased the pressure and they made another statement of, no, you can't talk about Jesus. You got to stop the miracle stuff. Stop all of it. They had imprisoned them overnight. God provided a miracle and the apostles were released. They went back and spoke at the temple again. And then last week at the end of that, the, the religious leaders, probably 71 individuals, pulled the apostles before them and just ratcheted up the pressure even more and said, you have got to stop talking about Jesus. And you've got to stop with this miracle stuff. We don't like it. Uh, and bad things are going to happen if you keep doing it. And that's where we kind of closed off last week. And so we're going to pick that story back up in verses 33 through 42 and kind of close off this powerful moment where we see that God is indeed an unstoppable God. Acts 5, 33 through 42 says, When they heard this, the religious leaders, they were furious and they wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed them, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theudas appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. So the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. 
And day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Would you pray with me? Father God, this morning as we unpack these, these 10 verses or so, God, we want to start off by saying with our own understanding, with my own um, words, nothing is going to change in our hearts. God, we need your Holy Spirit to be the one at work in us, teaching us and directing us in your truth. Thank you, God, that you have something to say to all of us, that you want to reach to each of our hearts, God. You want to teach us your good ways. You want us to understand and grow in the love that you have for us and that we in turn can have for you. And so, Father, may your Holy Spirit be the one guiding this entire process this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So the story continues, right? And we have this powerful statement from this man, this leader, Gamaliel, this Pharisee, this religious leader. But what we see in this first little tidbit, this first act of this passage, is that the apostles and the early church keep running up against this barrier, this brick wall, the religious leaders. Right? There were just two different viewpoints that were going to keep clashing. And so what we see here are the early church believers witnessing, sharing the gospel, talking about Jesus to those who have a heart of oppression. And by a heart of oppression, we'll see it. It says this, that first, when they heard Peter acknowledge that they were going to keep following God and that Jesus was Messiah, the religious leaders heard this and they were furious, and then they wanted to put these early believers to death. Now, if we remember it all through the life of Jesus, these are the same patterns and the same behaviors that the religious leaders had towards Jesus. He would speak, they would hear it, they would get mad, they plotted to kill him. I mean, that was the cycle. That was the story. And now the apostles are saying, hey, that Jesus, who we all killed, by the way, specifically you religious leaders, they're kind of lobbing the extra guilt there, who you killed, he was God's Messiah, and he's risen from the dead. Everything they're saying, the religious leaders disagree with, they don't like. Last week, we talked about that, that they were having to deal with this guilt, this reality of truth, as this is what happened, we are responsible. And we talked last week how those sorts of moments come up in our lives all the time, where we have these moments to face, oh, this one is my fault, I'm responsible with what happens next. And all of us love those moments. We look forward to them, right? No, when they show up, we say, how can I avoid responsibility? How can I put it off on someone else? How can I just brush this under the rug? How can I move on without dealing with the hard facts, the truth? See, what the religious leaders are doing is they are modeling the same heart that Pharaoh had. When the people of Israel were going to be called out from Egypt by God, it says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened towards them, that God continued to provide these proofs. Right, The 10 plagues were these ways God demonstrated, no, I am God, you are not Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh's heart kept being hardened to the truth. It reminds me a bit of like a rock slide. When a rock slide goes over a road. See, what was happening for this group of people, and it happens for you and I as well, is that we are headed a direction, something stops us, and then we have to reroute. For the religious leaders, they had to accept that they were completely wrong about Jesus and about God, and that this was going to require repentance. But what they did, which was what we do as well, is figured out a way to just try to pretend like it didn't exist or it wasn't true. The rock side really wasn't there. See, they were faced with the truth, but they were refusing to accept it. And unfortunately, when we get to these sorts of places, there are consequences that come from them. First off, when we refuse to accept our responsibility or our guilt in a circumstance, we're going to hurt those around us. And then second, also, 
equally and more important is that when we deny God's truth, when we say, no, what God is trying to say to me is not true, there are eternal consequences. The religious leaders were headed in a direction towards eternal consequences, forever being separated from God and living under his wrath, his judgment. This is the direction they were going. This is why Peter was unafraid to speak to them and say, look, this is the truth. It's in your hands what happens next. But what they were doing, unfortunately, this group of leaders, is that they weren't just accepting and denying the truth for themselves. They were then taking it the next step because they were telling the apostles, you are not allowed to tell anybody about this. It's one thing to say, stop talking to me. I don't want to hear it. It's a whole nother level when you say, don't talk to anybody about it. And if you do, I'm going to put pressure on you to try to stop you. The religious leaders were embodying and embracing and living in an incredibly hardened heart towards God where they weren't accepting the truth for themselves, and they were trying to not let anyone else experience that truth. There was a deeper anger and a resistance that was building, and they were becoming oppressors. They were becoming like Pharaoh, the one who would oppress them. They were becoming like Rome to Israel. Rome was oppressing Israel, and Israel's leaders were oppressing their own people. And when oppressors oppress, there are even higher levels of consequences when it comes to God's perspective. Isaiah 9, 14 through 17, this is prophecy about when the religious leaders, the leaders of Israel chose to deny God and lead people in this way. It says, so the Lord will cut off from Israel both head and tail, both palm branch and reed in a single day. What does that mean? It means the elders and dignitaries are the head and the prophets who teach lies are the tail. God is going to cut them off. It says those who guide this people mislead them and those who are guided are led astray. Therefore, the Lord will take no pleasure in the young men, nor will he pity the fatherless and widows. For everyone who is ungodly and wicked, every mouth speaks folly. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. What was happening is that at this time, when Isaiah was speaking this prophecy, and it's always true that when there are those who try to stop the gospel being shared with others, the consequences increase. And for those who are ahead of Israel, specifically God's people, they were coming in line with some harsh, harsh consequences from God because they were called to lead people towards him. Why is this so sad is that the religious leaders were just embracing resisting God. And for you and I, there's a sad truth is that we, number one, wrestle with that as well. When guilt and and shows up, when we have to admit the consequences of our sin, But there's also a sad truth because we know other people, people we might really care about and love, who just will not accept what God has to say, no matter what. And it's devastating. For this moment here, this is the religious leaders, and I'm sure Peter and the apostles were really burdened that the leaders of their nation were acting in this way. And for you and I, we experience the heartache the sadness when those we love have allowed their hearts to be so hardened to the truth. Jesus warned his apostles before his death, burial, and resurrection that this sort of thing was going to happen, that there were going to be times where there's people in our lives who just don't want to hear the truth. Matthew 10, 14, he tells his disciples when they're going to go out on their first mission journey. He says, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. That's hard, right? That's setting a boundary. 
that's saying, I can only go this far. The rest is up to you and how you respond to God. And that's a really, really tricky thing to do when it comes to a loved one, when it comes to a family member, when it comes to a neighbor or a good friend. And we see maybe some, some just damaging things happening in their lives. And we say, man, I've been praying for you. I've been, I've been trying to point you towards freedom and forgiveness and grace. And I've given you every opportunity. I've let you know about what God has in store for you. And then there are sometimes those moments where we say, and I just can't say anymore. And that is a really, really difficult place to be. But there's some good that we can trust in and know in those moments. Is that in order for God to say, for Jesus to say something like this to his apostles, he's saying, it's okay. There's a place where you can step back. It lets us know that we also can be people when God leads to let go of a situation, to let go of that roadblock, that hardened heart, to not own the responsibility of changing it. Why? Because God himself is the one who removes those barriers. God himself is the one who actually changes our hearts. It is not you and I. We can point the direction, but it's he who does the change. And know this about God, is that God desires a repentant heart more than you and I do. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. The good news about the work of God in the world is he sees the hardness in our hearts. He sees the roadblocks. He sees our resistance to change and he still loves us and he still desires to bring about newness in you and I. And if you have a loved one who has said, no, I want nothing to do with that, trust and know, find hope and peace in the fact that God cares more about them, more than, cares about them more than you or I do that he loves them more, that he understands the circumstances better, and he himself is working to bring about that change in them. And so you and I know we can let go if God's calling us to let go and step back. We also can know this, that no person is beyond God's grace. When Jesus says it's okay to let go, and God says, any point in someone's life and any point in someone's journey, God can grab a hold of their heart. All right? We had a congregation for a couple of years whose name was Ken, who at 90 years old came to faith. And for 90 years, his journey was full of ups and downs and hurt and refusing to hear the word of God. And I'm not gossiping about him because he himself stood and told us his story and wanted us to know his story. He said, I thought it was all about me and I hurt people and I lied. And when Jesus got hold of his heart at 90 years old, the last two years of his life were filled with joy and life and hope and forgiveness. And he went out of his way to apologize and to seek to forgive forgiveness from his family and to try to fix relationships and to allow God to change his heart. That story is encouraging and good because it reminds us that at no point in someone's life are too old or too distant from the work of God. And we can trust in that when God calls us and when we face and we come up with hearts that are hardened, that God desires heart change more than you or I, and no one is beyond that change. And also, also it's important for us to know this, that God stands in justice over oppressors. God stands in justice over those who continue to hurt and choose not to do anything about it and live their whole lives that way, not repentant, that he stands in justice over there. And that's also a hard truth for us to reconcile with sometimes. But God is not distant. He didn't just push play and go watch the world burn. He's involved. He's engaged. He's present. It seems sometimes like he's just letting it go, but he's not. He is daily bringing about his good work in the world, in our hearts and in the hearts around us. We can know that God is fully love and he's fully just, and he is completely involved in any hardened heart. And we can stand in this truth that no hardened heart 
exists outside God's overwhelming grace or his justice, that every single life counts and has a gaze and is in, God is fully involved with. And every single circumstance in life has an opportunity to experience his grace or his justice. The early church was experiencing this in a harsh way. This is what they were dealing with. They were witnessing to the heart of oppression, those who wanted nothing to do with God. But here's how God's unstoppable work happens. Because it doesn't just stop there. Because then, after they have the religious leaders are brought to fury and they want to kill the apostles, they want nothing to do with Jesus, this guy named Gamaliel who's a religious leader, also a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, who is honored by all the people. He stood up in the Sanhedrin. That's the whole group. And he orders that the apostles be put outside for a little while. And then he addresses the Sanhedrin. He says, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Gamaliel was a, a Pharisee, meaning he was one who the 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 nation of Israel held in high esteem that he was a law follower. He knew the heart of God and he kept the law well. And he encouraged others to follow the law well. Historians have found that there was actually an entire school of thought in Judaism named after him. He was incredibly well respected. He also was the rabbi of a guy named Saul of Tarsus, a Paul, the apostle. Gamaliel was his teacher. And what he does with this moment is he stands up in the Sanhedrin and he reminds everyone this, that the efforts of men come and go. He says, look, you are caught up in this moment. You are focused on what's happening here with the early church. You are letting yourselves think that this is the biggest thing that's ever going to happen and nothing can be worse than this moment. And you've got to act. And he says, hey, you know what you can do? You can step back from this. Let's gain some perspective. The efforts of men come and go. He tells them this. Some time ago, Theudas appeared. He claimed to be somebody. About 400 men rallied to him. Then he was killed. His followers are dispersed. It all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census. He led a band of people in revolt. He was killed, and all his followers were scattered. What Gamaliel is doing in this moment is he's speaking a truth about God and about man. We don't know if Gamaliel had any faith in Jesus at all. We're not sure. There's nothing that says he did. But what Gamaliel is doing in this moment is he's standing up and we are seeing firsthand God at work, God speaking truth through this man in this moment that matters to us today. He's reminding the Sanhedrin, look, the efforts of man come and go. There's, we have to gain a perspective that nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, but God lifts his voice and the earth melts. He says to them, therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. That's a really good truth to hear and to listen to apart from a circumstance, right? When we're distanced from it. So, oh, it's good for him to say to them. Right? When we see someone else under a lot of struggle or a lot of pain or a relationship is fractured, it's really good. We say, oh, you know what? Hey, God is working as good. God will bring about good in your life, right? It's easy to say when we're not in that moment. It's a hard truth to believe and to cling to in that moment. In this context, at this time, Israel was under the authority of Rome. Rome was the most powerful empire at the time. And Rome was probably the empire, from everything we know about world history, that lasted the longest. Rome lasted as an empire, as a nation for 1,500 years as the biggest expanse. Like 1,500 years. All of these other nations have come and go. Like we're, Our nation's 250 years, 60 years old or something. Math people can, can tell you after. And that seems like a long time, right? I mean, like there are there are restaurants in the UK that are a thousand years old, 
restaurants, bars, but anyway, uh, you know, but they've been around for a thousand years. Like Rome as a nation was around for 1500 years. When Gamaliel is telling the nation, hey, you know what? The efforts of men come and go. The nation of Israel is in the midst of Roman oppression. And here he is saying, you know what? We don't know what the apostles are about here. This just might be another rebellion. But you know what always happens? Rebellions fade. Nations rise and nations fall. People gather together and they get mad about something and then they get tired of it eventually. Or you know what? People rally and they fight and they bring about a cause and then 50 years later, no one even remembers it anymore. I mean, that's what he's saying to them. He's like, look, this is reality. If this, if these efforts are just human efforts, they will fade. That's an encouraging thing for us, but... It's also important that to, to understand that it doesn't belittle the difficult consequences and those things that happen from human effort. In this moment, Gamaliel is speaking a powerful truth that can encourage the listeners and give us perspective, but also guide our prayer. Because like I said, some of us might be in the midst of a really difficult circumstance. We say, yeah, I know nations come and go. I know hard things pass. But this has been going on for a while. I see no end. What this truth does, what this perspective does, is reminds us and gives us a guided prayer and hope for where we are right now, that this can't last forever, that it will stop at some point, that if it's a human effort, it will for sure end at some point. Gamaliel speaks this moment and this truth to this group. And there's no way he had in mind you and I today and what we might be facing. See, that's the unstoppable work of God. Is Gamaliel goes and says something, we have no idea if he had any interest in Jesus. But that statement 2,000 years ago is a statement that matters for us today. That's the unstoppable work of God. That nations rise, nations fall. The efforts of man come and go. They have limits. They have ends. They are not eternal. Even Rome will fall. We uh, so had some time of sabbatical, and the last little bit of it, we stayed at a little cabin with a little lake, and we got to take the kids fishing. Uh, and, and it was great. Like I, I, I loved taking them fishing. They, I didn't think they were interested at all, but they were. I'm not the best teacher of fishing. I'm just gonna be real clear. I'm not. Uh, but the lake we were at, it was like uh, my son Alari, and he's three and a half. He caught a fish because his uh, his hook was hanging in the water for a second while he fixed something. It was one of those lakes. So it was a great, great lake to go fishing. Uh, and he caught a bluegill, and it was a keeper, right? And so he caught it and he's like, oh, we're going to, we're going to eat this. You know, maybe we'll, I, I set it aside. They were all excited. Like, yeah, let's eat fish. I'm like, all right, you guys don't even like chicken, but we'll see what we can do here. Right. And so we, we get the moment and we're here we are, and we're going to, we're in this place and good things are going to happen. We're fishing. And then I go to clean the fish and there's not even, I mean, it's butter knives. That's what we've got to deal with there. I didn't bring anything sharp. It's, it's the sharp knives are spoons. And I'm like, all right, and he's like, man, I want to watch this. I want to see this happen. I want to watch you clean the fish, dad. And I'm like, okay, you know, here we go. And it was the most gruesome <laughs> representation of fish cleaning that has ever existed. It was awful. It was bad. And he's just sitting there watching it, of course, you know. And I'm like, don't worry. This is good. Fishing is fun. You're like, Argh. you know, fishing is great. Dad's not mad. And, you know, this is like, it's fine. This is a fun thing, right? And he's like, I think so. You know, and then we get it all done. And, and we go and we, and we clean our, you know, inch and a half piece of fish because that's all that's left. And we, we eat it and we put it in front of him. He's like, I've never eaten that, Dad. Like, that is the worst thing I could have ever imagined fishing to be. Thankfully, they kind of enjoyed fishing still. They're just like, we just don't ever want to keep a fish. Please don't ever make us keep one. Like, right, that's fine. We can do that. But I mean, that's just a little bit. It's a laughter. It's a joke, right? But that's a representation, maybe a good picture for you of like when we get in these places and just the worst possible experiences happen. It's good to remember 
that God exists beyond all of that. We can make a complete mess of what's going on in front of us. And we can sit here and be like, I don't think you're even going to want to go outside again. Like, I, you probably don't trust dad anymore, right? Like, this is all bad. This is the second time that I told him nature is good and then something bad happened. So that's another story. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but the important truth as we pull back is this, is that the efforts of men come and go. We can find hope and truth in that. It's not to belittle the consequences, but it is to remember that God exists above and beyond all of that. Gamaliel continues that statement. He says, men come and go, but if this work of the apostles is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. I feel like every single one of us needs that verse just here, right? Right here, tattooed. Go for it. Get it. Put it right on your forehead. Put it on your mirror. It says, if this effort is from God, you will not be able to stop it. You will only find yourself fighting against God. I mean, how much pain would we save ourselves? How much pain would we save others if that was our perspective when we're in our circumstances? That if this is of God, if what God is doing, if the stirrings I have, if this truth I'm hearing, if these convictions I'm feeling, if this is of him, I have got to submit humbly to this. The story of King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel is one of my favorites because we get to see a man who is at the peak of his pride and his influence, and he's given a warning about it. He says, if you don't stop thinking you're God, there's going to be consequences. Well, he doesn't stop thinking he's God, and there are consequences, and the consequences that come are this. It says, immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was filled. He was driven away from people, and he ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Just think for a second. Whoever the influential um, world leader is in your mind, what they look like now, now having hair of an eagle and nails like the claws of a bird. And someone's like, oh man, God, please make that happen, right? But at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is him telling his story. I raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High, and I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, what have you done? What happens for Nebuchadnezzar is he is at the peak of pride. He does not listen. He experiences just the worst consequences that he was promised. But then there's redemption. Then humility comes. And what he is able to do is to experience the freedom and the grace and the forgiveness of God in his life. And he's able to tell his story to the world. I mean, that's a story to just go make public so anyone can know it. This is a man who fought against the work of God. He said, no, God's got nothing on me. I can handle this. Of course, he experiences what it's like to fight against the work of God, the pull of God, the will of God in our lives. And then the beautiful thing is he accepts this humility. Here's what I think is really awesome about this statement of Gamaliel as we close this. Is that Gamaliel... When he talks to the Sanhedrin, he sends all of the apostles out. Which means this, none of the apostles heard him say that. Right? They were all gone. The followers of Jesus were not in that meeting. You know what that means? Someone heard that. It might have been Gamaliel. It might have been one of the other Sanhedrin. One of, someone heard that statement. Someone clicked. Someone got it. Jesus got a hold of someone's heart in that meeting. And then they went and told the apostles the story. 
How else would that moment have gotten to the apostles to be written down in scripture? God's unstoppable work happened even when the apostles were out of the room. He used Gamaliel to speak truth and then somebody or many people, we don't know, hearts were changed for the gospel of Jesus. God's unstoppable work is good news in this, that the deepest root and the most powerful acts of evil do not escape or overpower the work of God. None of them do in our lives, in the lives around us, in the world we live in. Lastly, how do the apostles respond? They respond with joyful obedience. It says Gamaliel's speech persuaded them, the Sanhedrin. So they call in the apostles and then they had them flogged, which means they were whipped 39 times, all of them. And then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and they let them go. And so the apostles did what all of us would do. They left rejoicing because they'd been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, not because they were set free, but because they experienced the inheritance of Jesus. Did you know that? That's part of the inheritance of Jesus. Romans 8, 17 says this, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Anything was fun getting whipped? Of course not. That was awful. That's traumatic. That's violent. It's terrible. But what they do in pulling out from that and leaving it is saying, whoa, we are being persecuted and oppressed in the same way that Jesus did. We are being treated like he was treated. You know what that means? That means we're doing the right thing. That means we're walking in his ways. He told us it was going to happen. Here it is. How affirming, right? They find joy in that. Like we can keep going. We can keep doing it. We just got whipped. We're good. To, this is the right thing to do. I mean, this is the mindset, not because they thought it was fun, because they understood their perspective was focused in on this is God at work in me. And even if it hurts, even if it costs me a lot, even if I got to keep coming before the Sanhedrin, saying the same thing and getting whipped and going back to the temple, I'm going to keep doing it because I know this is what God has called me to. And in this, I find life and joy. It's a beautiful story to see for them. But I tell you what, right now, I don't like when things aren't even like oppressive because just life, right? I feel like the world's against me when the air conditioning doesn't work, right? When I'm out of coffee, it's like, why does God hate me, right? I mean, that's that's how, what we do, right? I mean, that's our lives. Like uh, we get hurt and we're like, well, no one else has got hurt like me before. This is the worst thing. I God is targeting me, right? That's what the world we live in. We're really self-centered people. Thank God he loves us and is at work in us anyway. But the beauty of what the early church demonstrates for us and the encouragement, the challenge, the focus that we can have from it is this, is that they take what had happened. They take the story. They take the experiences. They feel affirmed by God. And then they go back to their daily lives. They go back to what they've been doing and they allow God to be one to loosen the grip of evil. I don't know if you were a Looney Tunes fan or a Tom and Jerry fan, but it just, what always happens in those cartoons and those stories is, or often frequently enough, is someone is holding on to something, right? A ledge, and just one finger at a time gets pulled off, right? And usually if it's Tom and Jerry, it's a hammer, right? It's a hammer for each finger. Boop, boop, boop. And then eventually the person falls. The good news about what God does in the world and through you and I and our lives is that he uses who we are, what we have, to just loosen the grip of evil in the world. And he does that work in your hearts and in my hearts every day if we let him just to keep working away at those fingers, just to keep removing a little bit of evil, a little bit of sin, just to keep bringing about and replacing that evil with good. That looks like consistency. It looks like obedience. It looks like day after day, 
in the temple courts, and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah, they had faced obstacles or roadblock. There was nothing going to change the hearts of the Sanhedrin from their experience. But they also were walking in the obedience of an unstoppable God who's going to change hearts and work in ways that we don't understand who's going to bring about his grace and his mercy and his redemption when we don't think any of it can happen, is going to bring about his justice as well. And so what they were able to do and what you and I can do is just walk obediently in faith and in trust, saying, you know what? I am called to this place. You and I, this is the town we live in. We have the jobs we have. We have the neighborhoods we have. We have the church that we gather in. And God wants to use us to just keep removing the fingers of evil and sin in our hearts and in our community and for those lives around us. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how he's going to guide us. I don't know whose story is going to rise up and inspire and encourage. I don't know who's going to come forward and say, you know what? God has been laying all of this. I got a testimony or man, I'm going to go. I've got had a burden on my heart for my neighbor or man, this is the journey we're in. I don't know what any of that looks like. None of us do. But we can know that God wants to do that work through us, and he is doing that work through us. And you know what that brings? That brings joyful obedience. Man, God is the one doing something. He's doing something through what we're doing right now here today. Gathering together, sharing fellowship and worship and time in his word, encouraging each other. Letting each other know we love each other and care for each other and are praying for each other. Checking in on each other throughout the week. Letting that extend to others. He works out and releases and loosens that grip of evil in our hearts and in this world through that daily obedience in public. All right, They were in the temple, the public sector, declaring new life and freedom and victory. Also from in homes. It says from house to house they went and shared the story. You know what that looks like? That looks like going to each other's houses and sharing a cup of coffee when just there can't be anything worse happening in the, in the home right now. And to share those burdens together and to be a shoulder, and to be one who can declare hope and purpose and God's intimate joy in those moments together, to allow him to bring us closer together, that loosens the grip of evil. And they continued to proclaim, it says they never stopped, meaning in every season when things were going great and things were terrible, and everything in between, they continued to walk in this obedience and continued to proclaim that Jesus is the Christ. They let him be unstoppable and they just were obedient. That's what it looks like. God using our joyful obedience to undo the deep-rooted grip of evil in this world. It's simple, really. It is. And it's beautiful because we're going to get to that roadblock We're going to get to that hardened heart and maybe it's in ourselves and maybe it's in a loved one. We're going to get to that place where here's God's truth and repentance and here's just the self. And what we can do is trust and know that God desires life change and new life and repentance more than any of us do. And if it's for us personally, we get to that place and say, okay, God, I'm going to entrust you to bring about this change in me because I can't overcome it on my own. Or if it's someone that we love saying, you know what, God? Guide me in how I can be a support, how I can speak truth if I need to keep speaking or if I need to step back. God, let me know what that looks like in trusting ourselves and each other to God's work. And remembering that the deepest roots and the most powerful acts of evil in the world and in our hearts do not escape or overpower the work of God. Know this to be true in yourself, that your worst is not beyond. God's grace. And know that for those around you, that their worst is not beyond God's grace at any point. And remember that God uses you and I and our joyful obedience to undo the deep-rooted grip of evil in this world. Through daily obedience, consistency, publicly in our homes, in our neighbor's home, allowing him just to use our stories and whatever we've got to bring about that goodness. It's not always glamorous. 
Sometimes it's a pretty simple thing. We're just called to obedience. He's the one who's unstoppable. Let's pray, God. Thank you for that truth. Thank you for the fact that you are at work, God, bringing about new life in our hearts and in this town and in this world, God, whether we can see it or not. God, I pray right now that if there are those of us who have a roadblock to your grace in our hearts right now, if we've got some sin we've got to repent from, if we've got some behaviors we need to apologize for, God, or if we've just got an attitude of bitterness towards you or towards someone else, God, may you be the one that we turn to. God, may we be humble enough to lay it at your feet and say, you know what? My life is a vapor, and yet the God of the universe loves me. May we submit to that. And God, if there are those who we love who are in that place now, God, give us the wisdom and the strength to come alongside them to speak truth and to entrust them to you, God, knowing that you're the one who cares more, the most. And Father, if we come to these places where, where we're um, not sure what it looks like to be a follower of you, God, may we remember just the simple reality that you just call us to obedience. It's just about being humble. It's just about trusting you and walking and taking those, making those statements and speaking truth when you call us to, or, or being kind or being generous or being a friend when you call us to God. And thank you that there are all of these endless ways in which you release the grip of evil on the world, God, and that you involve us in that work. May we find a real sense of encouragement and purpose in that, God. If we're facing some real evil in our homes or in ourselves, or God, if we see the impact of sin and our loved ones or our neighbors, God, may we remember that our simple acts of obedience through the power of your Holy Spirit, God, changes hearts and lives. God, may we find courage and hope and strength in you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and close our last song this morning?